right, everybody. Here we are in week 19 of Foundations of Fabrication 2022. And we're going to be talking about electronics inputs this week. So we're going to be adding senses to our electronics. We're going to go over this concept in general. We're going to talk about what it is, how it fits in with the world, and sort of what's happening. And as, as we do that, we're going to see sort of what this looks like in many different ways. We're gonna cover not all of the possible inputs, but hit a lot of the big players and talk about how you might integrate these into your electronics projects. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about coding so far. We had a couple of weeks of that, then we did our fun bio week, which is really cool. And now we're gonna go through all of the different types of inputs that we can, that we can think about. We're gonna list out the 25 most common of these inputs. And there's tons of different options for how you can get information from the world into electronic systems. And we'll go over some of the big ideas and really focus on six essential inputs, things that you should know exist. Uh, even if you haven't played around with one, haven't made it work in a while or ever, but just to, to know that they're out there as options, because with these six, you can make a lot happen. Then the last, then we'll talk about chip to chip communication and then multi input tricks, some, some things that you can do. But there's, this is just getting started for electronics. For electrical engineering, you can have your own, you can totally get a degree in it. There's a plug over here if you want, Vincent. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of options of things that we can go through, but we're gonna take a look at these and try and understand as much as we can about them. So the first thing to do is just to itemize or list out like what are electronics inputs and what, what, are, some of their, what are some examples? And so here are 25, a ridiculous grid of 25 options. And so I've broken them down into five categories. Um, the, these are, this is an overwhelming list. I just want to say that outright. But this breaks things down into a few categories. First off, there's switches. These are all types of switches along here. These are variable resistors, resistors that can change their value. Uh, semiconductors, and so this gives you sort of a category of things that sometimes transmit electricity, sometimes they don't. Then there's more complicated, complex sensors that, that exist over here. And so you can find a bigger list if you want to. Here's the Fab Academy list of inputs. And so this is a huge list that gets real specific. They cover all sorts of different things, including like camera modules and, and force sensors and strain gauges and sound and all sorts of different categories that you might have. Um, but this, this list can be pretty, uh, pretty aggressive. I just want to, I just want to say, so if you're interested in how you could measure temperature or those sorts of things, you can totally get to it by linking here, but mostly we just want to stick to these main categories. Um, and the blue ones are the ones that we're really going to go over in depth today, just to say like what they are, but it's worth it to say that or to, to go through each one and just give them, you know, their, their 15 seconds of fame. For switches, these are the SPST, SPDT, DP, those like alphabet soup up there on the top. Those are the code names for buttons. Uh, there's lots of different types of switches and buttons. And so those are the, the common ways that you might buy them. SPST is single pull, single throw. And that's just the way that they can connect to each other. If you've ever had a switch that changes a motor's direction, it was probably a DP, DT switch. But those are, there's many, many, many layers to unpacking just this one box. That's pretty much true for all of these, uh, but we're just gonna sort of buzz our way through. Limit switches are something that you'll commonly see on the 3D printers downstairs. Those are buttons that are specifically designed to be at the edge of something. So if you have a, a moving piece, like a moving motor along a 3D printer, it'll need to move all the way to an edge, an edge and a limit switch will be able to, to identify that. Those are also sometimes called micro switches. Push buttons are really, really common. We're gonna look at those in just a second, but those are the traditional button that you think of. In, your, in an Arduino kit or in the, the practice Proto Shield, these, this is the little button with two legs that you soldered into place. That's the sort of normal button. There's magnetic switches, read switches. These are activated with magnets. If you have an alarm system on a door or a window where it can tell if the door is open or closed, probably on the door is a magnet and then there's a read switch just inside. They also have these for like when you open your closet, if you want a light to turn on, read switches could work for that. And then there's encoders, which were also on your test circuit, that, that uh, practice 
circuit board that we made for an Arduino shield. And so these measure rotation, they would definitely fall into the category of switches, even though they're a, a weird one. A big section of inputs, these are other categories. There's potentiometers. These are like what you'd have as a knob on a guitar. So you can change audio levels. There's linear and then audio logarithmic ones. So type A and type B, but those are definitely important inputs if you're into audio at all. There's thermistors or temperature sensors. Those change based on temperature and essentially what it's describing its relationship to, in this case, thermistors, it's a sensor that can measure temperature, right? The next one is a light dependent resistor. It's a sensor that can measure light in a room. And so an LDR is a cheap device. There's also photo transistors, a few different types of devices in this category, but they can measure light uh, in the environment. Flex or force resistors, these are resistors that change based on pressure that's applied or pull that's given. And so you can have interesting things happen with those. The, uh, there are people that have built gloves to add to VR systems. So you can move your fingers and with flex sensors in them, it can measure how much your, your fingers move and put that into a game. And then load cells. These are everyone's favorite and least favorite all at the same time. It is the bathroom scale. A load cell like this is able to take on some weight. It's able to hold you up and the amount that it, that it flexes can use to turn into weight. Semiconductors, there's phototransistors also for light, Hall effect sensors, magnetic field sensors. There's microphones, which are interesting semiconductors. Yeah. Would you be able to think of them as being like force resistors or being able to just hold them more weight? Uh, yeah, load cell is an interesting thing. Let's do, and we're not gonna go into them too much. Here's the, you know, Valentine's Day. Here's a load cell like this. And basically this is a good example of one. So it's this little tiny membrane that's added onto the side of a piece of aluminum usually, and a piece of metal. Oh, here's a great picture. This is going to stretch and bend in certain ways. Usually it's a piece of aluminum and you put a, a weight on it. This might be a fixed wall and the weight is gonna push down on this piece. It's extra thin in these places and that's where they put the sensors. And so when they're compressed or stretched, when they get thinner and longer or thicker and shorter, their conductivity changes. And so it's able to sense those very tiny adjustments in the, the movement or stress and strain of a material. And if you know sort of how much your material is gonna strain, then you can map that to its electrical properties, which is interesting. And so it works really well for bathroom scales because you can just get a stronger piece of aluminum. Like this is, if you open up a bathroom scale, they often look kind of like this-ish inside. There's probably four of these in the corner. Um, these are pretty easy to buy online where they've got a big chunk out of this aluminum bar. And then there's the load cell right there on the edge of this like flexible, easy to bend part. And then some screw holes for, for mounting things. Uh, load cells like this are tricky. Like there's some complexity to them. They're not as easy as other things to get to work. But once you get once you crack that code, it becomes a nice a nice useful piece. Different from the force resistors. Uh, force resistors change their resistance directly, and it's a pretty big change in resistance. So their resistance changes enough that the microcontroller can directly observe. Um, uh, and then that's a property of the force resistor versus the load cell, it's a much more subtle change. And so you need extra amplification to really measure it in a meaningful way. But they're really resistant and they're resilient. And so they get used in lots of situations where you want a digital scale. So, for cases where you don't expect that much weight or that much, yeah, that's when you use force resistors. Yeah, like in the VR glove, a force resistor is perfect because it won't take a lot of force. You're not going to pick up a truck while wearing your VR gloves. And it's just going to be the back and forth movement of your fingers. So low force, maybe extra movability. Uh, and if it breaks, it's not like anyone's going to be in harm's way. Whereas load cells can handle much heavier loads and the electronics get a little bit more complicated. But they're fascinating. And if you buy them online, they always come with the electronics kit to go with it. So that's good. Um, a common one is a PIR motion sensor. Almost everybody's seen one of these in real life. It's the little weird white uh, circle on your garage door so that when somebody walks in front of it, the light turns on. It's essentially a digital recreation of a bug's eye. 
And it's not really a camera per se, it's just looking for changes in the infrared light coming in from different sections of its field of view. And so it's a great way to be able to, to look at the room and see if anything's moving in it, any people are moving around in it or cats or whatever. And these are really easy to implement nowadays and really, really useful. I have one of these in my living room that's running all the time. I've got a magic mirror that only turns on if someone's walking around inside the room. Or it will make you feel bad if you've been sitting so still on the couch that it doesn't register that you're there. And then you move and it turns on, which is, you know, that happens sometimes. Uh, there's also time of flight distance sensors or like LIDAR, radar sorts of things. Those are really cool. Uh, pretty easy to use and you can measure distance as well. This is fun if you've got a self-driving robot, you can have it move around. Over here, these complicated ones, these, these get more esoteric. So I don't wanna, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on these, but GPS is cool. These are like $40 modules at this point. If you want a GPS integrated into your project, you just buy one of these and, and wire it in. It's really fun. You can get ethanol, CO2, gas sensors online pretty cheaply. You could build your own breathalyzer if you want it. Uh, so that's a that's a fun, it's a fun and dangerous trick. It's it's a good one though. So those sorts of things are really helpful. And so you can play around with gases. There's proper LIDAR. LIDAR is really a fun uh, trick. It's, LIDAR can be expensive. It depends on what you're up to. So here it's, you can see LIDAR. Let's just go to images for this. Here's LIDAR like around a car. They're commonly using it nowadays in, in autonomous vehicles where they're scanning everything around. So there's this kind of LIDAR, which is very high end. But if we search LIDAR Arduino, there's LIDAR modules that you can get for $60. I mean, it's not the cheapest thing in the world, don't get me wrong, but this is essentially the same sort of module that's on the top of those cars. They're just spinning it in a way that it's pointed out in different directions. So you can totally buy one of these. They're even in stock, it looks like in some places. So you can absolutely access them. Uh, LIDAR, Arduino, Amazon. Uh, LIDAR, Amazon. One of LIDAR has become a lot more reasonable to access. Like here's something, LIDAR has become much, much, much more useful. They put this commonly on the bottom of helicopters to scan the ground. And so they, flow over, they fly over the Amazon looking for things in general. And they found recent, not, well, maybe not super recently, but at some point they found ancient uh, ruins that we didn't know were there. You fly over and the LIDAR can sort of look down through the trees if you calibrate it just right and look at surface features. And this definitely pops out as some sort of ancient ruins. So there's some really cool stuff that is there. There's also LIDAR, uh, iPad, kitchen. Uh, since we've since I talked about this the first time around, LIDAR has been added to the iPod, the iPad Pro. And so if you have one of the new iPad Pros, there's an app, let's see. I think it's the CNET article is going to get you there, but this, the iPad pro has LIDAR built in. It's not really an Apple integration thing at that point, but it does have, um, for AR enhanced iPad pro, here's the app canvas. It will scan a room instantly. This is marketed to contractors who can walk into your kitchen and wave it around at the room. And then they don't need to stay in your house for a long time measuring sorts of things. They can just use the scan and come up with a model of the house and the room, which is really, really cool. So this is a, a neat application of LIDAR just to see what it can do when applied at a high end. This is, I, I wanna say this is like LIDAR and pixel matching and, and photogrammetry and camera stuff all wrapped into one spot, but it's a really cool application. Coding this yourself on an Arduino going to be next to impossible, but it shows you the potential of what some of these sensors are able to do when you do have that large code base added on top of the core of that, of that thing. And so here's like the, the CAD, you can see it's able to scan a room and get a pretty nice picture of what's going on. And you can definitely imagine the value for a contractor to just be able to measure the height of that opening and those sorts of things as you go around and look at all these different measurements, which is pretty wild with up to 99% accuracy. So, and, and I don't wanna stay on this for too long because then it feels like an advertisement, but LIDAR is really cool. Uh, the cheaper robot back. That's why I learned about those. Oh yeah. And then I got the like, 
So. Yeah, a, a cheaper robot vacuum is a great goal, but the, the sensors are still a lot. I, they can get away with selling them at the prices that they do because they're bulk ordering those parts. And so when you buy 10,000 LiDAR sensors, they become cheaper per price per item, which is, you know, breaks the spirit a little bit, but it's that's how economies of scale work. <laughs> yeah, no, I, there's and there's definitely an open uh, vacuum robot movement. I know it exists. I've not investigated much, um, but it's still it's totally a thing that's out there. Uh, also, you can get cameras. Cameras work really well for Raspberry Pi projects. Not so much for Arduino. They're often too much computationally, but it's a fun way to work. There's color sensors you can buy. I had a high school sophomore who really leaned into these color sensors. He wanted to be able to put anything next to his his piece of work and be able to get the hex color code so we could put it onto a website. So we hold up an object and it would read the color. Air pressure is fun. Uh, these Sometimes these are in watches even. They're really small modules so that you can tell your altitude based on air pressure or like the weather that's coming based on air pressure. These nine DOF sensors, accelerator, accelerometer, gyrometer, and magnetometer. If you know how to run a nine DOF sensor really, really well, stop now and go get a job at Google. That's tons and tons of inflowing information and it's wicked tricky to make that work. It's done with, with uh, instead of talking about like pitch, yaw and roll, like you might in an airplane, they're almost exclusively described with, and I'm gonna say the word wrong, but I know what it is mathematically, with quarter nions, with like fourth dimensional vectors to describe the position of the highest acceleration, which is like the, the direction of gravity, uh, gyrometer, so you can tell how things are moved, and then a magnetometer to orient to space and orientation. If you've ever yelled at your phone because it told you you were headed in the wrong direction while you were driving down the street, like the car looked like it was pointed off to the left, but going in the right direction, it was this nine DOF sensor was not agreeing with your GPS, and it didn't quite know how to deal with it. There's also human pulse sensors. These are pretty easy to add in. Uh, they're fun to use. A pulse ox you can totally play around with. They're the green flashing light on the bottom of your Fitbit. So that's the pulse sensor. Then there's capacitive touch, which is lots of fun. This is super easy. It's the way to make a button without having to have anything move, no moving parts. And then real-time clocks, which are cool just because of how well they integrate with electronics. That so you can get a clock that really holds its time. And with a, a small watch battery can hold its time for 30 days unpowered because Arduino suck away some of that power. But in order to do that, we need to sort of set the stage. How do these inputs even do anything? What are they, what are they all about? What's going on inside of them? And it really starts with this one little circuit, the voltage divider. And ultimately, what we need to think about is sort of the context that all of this lives in. We've got digital devices in an analog world. Um, analog computers have been used for a long, long time back Back in, I'm gonna say thousands of years ago, there were hats that were made that specifically would count and sort of work your way through when you could expect the next solar eclipse to happen. People would physically build things. Shipwrights would build complex sets of gears that would make predictions about the tides. There's all sorts of analog ways to compute things. And that's, that's an interesting area of research that is circling back. It's become more popular again in the past few years because it's just computationally inexpensive. Um, it doesn't take a big computer to do it. But digital computers are something that really came around in World War II. And Alan Turing is the fantastic story of how that came to be. But basically, the whole world is messy and analog all the time. And Alan Turing had this central, essential idea about how you make everything digital. And so you might have had an analog TV or analog radio, and it's all switched over to digital now. And fundamentally, it's because of this one core insight that was, that was basically Alan Turing's responsibility for making it real. And so it's something that's tricky to talk about, but not too hard to show you. And so what I want to do is come into here, and I'm going to, let's do file. Actually, I want to do some Arduino stuff. I've got an Arduino on the desk. And so I'm going to click a few things through, play around with some of the details. And now we're going to get something, something to work. So I'm going to go to file examples 
analog, here's analog in out serial. So this is one of the built-in examples in Arduino. I've got Arduino all pulled up. This is intended to read analog pin zero and then it'll output on pin nine to an LED. I don't have an LED that'll be attached there. And what I wanna do is take and do, do a few things. I'm gonna say output value, well, let me first run this particular sketch. I'm going to do some quick code edits because that can be helpful. So serial print line, and then we'll, we'll make this into a thing. So basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna read the analog input pin of an Arduino that I have on the table with me. That's right here. And it's just going to output that reading onto the serial monitor. And so if I take this, open the serial monitor, which is on exactly the wrong screen, do, 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 like this, and right there, there we go. And if I upload this, make sure that I've got everything connected, check all the right boxes and upload this sketch. Oh boy, is it gonna throw me an error? Connecting to the IO board. What's it doing? Oh, it's doing an update right now. <laughs> Let's let it compile. Compiling sketch, done compiling, and now we're going to do an upload. It's uploading to the Arduino. Set this over here. And you can see I've got numbers that are scrolling in and they're changing as it goes, right? So there's some movement that's happening over there. And this is helpful. Like you can see things sort of shift around. But I think that one of the things that's really interesting is we can, we can play around with this system. I want to do uh, a little bit of fiddling with this. And so I'm going to change some things. This is just reading the sensor value. And from the code, when you read sensor values, they come in commonly at 0 to 1023. So sensor values come in in this range. And what I want to do is change that to 0 to 5,000. We're going to treat these like millivolts. And so I should get a reading, a readout that's somewhere between 0 and 5,000. And if I do this with a couple new code edits, I ought to get two values. One is the sensor reading. So this first column is going to be all of the sensor readings, just like we saw. And then this is how many millivolts that represents. And so you can see in, in the room, and it's a little tough to show you. Oh, let me switch my camera around. So I'll swap in here. I'll do a quick cut. So in the room, I've got a camera pointed at an Arduino. And basically, if I wave my hand near this Arduino, if I if I do this, then the Arduino is my hands near it, and you can see the values changing on the screen. So as I'm doing that, it's live shifting around. The numbers on the left are the ADC values. So this is just sort of a measurement that's amorphous. It doesn't have any real context, but this is how many volts it thinks it has. And so if I wave my hand near it, it goes up to like all the all the way to three three volts. And if I pull my hand away, it goes down. Uh, and it definitely shifts around quite a bit. If I move my other hand in front, different things happen. This is a, it's a fascinating prospect. But if I do control shift P, if I go to this and pull up the serial plot, nope, not print, not page setup. It's not what I want. If I go to serial plotter, control shift L, here's, here's a readout of things, right? So you can see that these two are mapped to each other, but basically, what it's giving me is the, the blue line is the value that's the ADC output. And then the red is just the, the output voltage. And so up here would be four volts, three volts, two volts, and one volt. And so it turns out that the world is messy, right? And my electrical signal that I'm giving to it can range all the way from like four. If I, if I played my cards right, I could probably get it to go above four. Then it comes down to one, right? And so this is the analog signals of the world. There's all sorts of things in here that are very, very analog and, and built up to be one thing or the other. It would be nice if it was more clean cut, right? And so the digital world doesn't like this messiness, right? So as we play around and as I do this, you can see it scales and changes. That is not a good digital system. Alan Turing was set around the idea of solving this problem. And so what he did was he took the analog input. And so here you can see my analog things are looking a little bit different. 
Um, but it's definitely just by plugging in a wire, I've got sort of an antenna and I'm able to more easily throw it from the, the bottom to the top. So it's going all the way from five to zero. And if I plug it in directly to ground, it sits on the zero line. And if I plug it into my five volt pin, it sits at the 5,000 line without varying at all. And so in a perfect world, you can see it's at 5,000 on the top and basically zero at the bottom. If I unplug, it starts to wave around again. And then I've got a 3.3 volt pin, if I can get plugged into it, where it'll sit right at 3.3 volts or pretty much at 3.3 volts. In a perfect world, you'd want a digital system to only live in one of those buckets, right? To be either zero or five volts and nothing in between. And so what Alan Turing really set out to do was to try and make that happen. This, by the way, is a floating pin. Floating pins are generally bad in electronics. You don't want to do that. It's essentially an antenna. And if it's an antenna, when you don't want an antenna, you're just getting a bunch of noise, right? So that's, that's what this is doing. When it's responding, when I put my hand near it, that's because of static electricity on my hand in a dry room. It's not because there's anything meaningfully happening or that this is any way predictable. Like waving my hand near it seems to make it go to five. But if I like rub my hands together and sort of stabilize or like put, wash my hands with water, which would take some of the charge buildup off of them, it would, it would shift around in different ways. Learning how to wrangle this is really the core of what our input system is all about. Uh, and so there's a handful of things that you can do. Like I can switch this from being instead of analog read, I can say, well, let's not do that. Let's do a, a digital read. Digital read, analog input pin. We can, so oops, let's do that. This may or may not work with A0. Depends on the particular version of Arduino. But this is now making a judgment call about whether it's zero or five. And so you can see the scaling's off. Like there's some things that are freaking out, but it's making a choice between either zero or one. When you say, I wanna do a digital read, it makes it choose. Do I go into the low bucket or the high bucket? Is it five volts or is it zero volts? And the Arduino needs to make, make a choice. And this is way simpler, by the way, for the internal electronics to do, but it's able to choose either high or low. And there's no wiggly business. You can see that it's probably still happening in the background, like you can imagine that. But by being digital, it chops it into simple signals that are either high or low. That's the brilliance of Alan Turing, that you can take something that's fundamentally messy, has weird curvy lines to it, and put it into states that are either a zero or a one, and then computationally work with just those two types of values. So that is really a brilliant move that took us from a, a big set of chaos to something that's much, much more reasonable to work with by just having inputs and output values. All of this is, is entirely based around the ability to get this all to work with electrical systems. And the Arduino is such a simple electrical system that it doesn't hurt to see this happen, right? That here we are, we're doing the graphing. All of this was happening under the hood where like it's now I'm really statically charged because I've been touching this thing a bunch. But you can see if I ground myself, I'm able to get weird, like not square movements that happen in here. So that is bad for electronics. Getting it to work in a stable way is what the voltage divider is all about. So every piece of electronics everywhere is always an analog piece of electronics. Then there's some things that can deal with them really well, like devices with analog to digital converters that can deal with those analog signals really nicely. And then there's Arduino analog pins. Most digital signals still have this analog noise inside, but they just put a band that says, if it's above this certain threshold, we're gonna count it as a one. If it's below this threshold, we count it as a zero, that's it. Analog systems can address those medium levels. It can take the highs and the lows and in between values and really make sense of them. That's what all of this is all about. If you really feel like it, you can totally do the math uh, for how this works. This is R1 and R2, the voltage divider, just like this. If you have two resistors that are gonna make a change, you can read their output by thinking about the dynamic between them. It follows a really fascinating mathematical model. And if the voltage or the, if the resistance of this photoresistor changes based on the amount of light that hits it, putting it in series with a fixed resistor makes a really predictable output so that you can very reliably and measurably decide exactly what this voltage will be and then how that's gonna affect your Arduino. 
you can go way deep into this. It's lots of fun. I love nerding out on the math, but that's maybe not the fun part of today. Uh, in any case, there's the ADC, the analog to digital converter chip, the thing that does the analog read on the Arduino. It's able to shift around. And if you have a two bit ADC, it can decide if it's going to have values of 0, 1, 2, or 3. A five bit ADC can give you 0 to 15. It's, it's a binary counting system. So more bits give you bigger numbers. And the Arduino is an eight bit counting system. So it's 0 to 1023. So it gives you a range of values for how many little stacks of slivers it can break it up into, or it's a 10 bit on our Arduino, my apologies. That brings it to 1023. And so the 10 bits lets you have a thousand divisions here. So you can get pretty granular with what your voltage is. And that, that's enough for basically all the measurements that you'll need to do. Uh, so that's the core of like how this works on a mechanical level, like what's going on with the, electros the electronics. But now let's talk about these six essential inputs. These are just the start. There's tons and tons and tons of things to explore. Don't try and take this as a comprehensive list, but it's a good place to get going. The first step is the light dependent resistor. And so here it is in Tinkercad. And so you can see there's a photoresistor. This changes its resistance based on the amount of light that hits it, and then a fixed resistor. So this fixed resistor right here is always the same. And the mathematical relationship for this is exactly what we just saw. But basically, this will change what the Arduino sees. And when you do that change, you're going to get different outputs. It's fun to play with. You can adjust those sorts of things. And inside of Tinkercad, it's, it's definitely something that you can fiddle around with. Um, so as we play with those things, I think this is one. This is what I was looking for. And so inside of here, this is loading one. You can imagine if we start the simulation, the amount of light that you have shining on this impacts how it's going to behave. And this is a weird, like, this is a tilt switch. There's some things going on here. But inside of this, if I adjust this setting inside of my code and then look at my serial monitor, I'm getting different values based on how much light there is. And so as I shift around the amount of light, things are going to change around in the code base. This looks like Maybe it's a little, it's a little erratic. Um, maybe this wasn't the best the, the example that I wanted, but you can play around with these relationships if you want to get all of these things hooked up. Oh yeah, this is definitely broken from the last time that I looked at it. Sorry about that. Uh, but the light dependent resistor is a great first piece. It uses the voltage divider where you can mathematically describe this. It's usually not a calibrated value, but it can judge brighter or darker. These are so useful that they're in every one of the lamps that you put outside your house that turns on at dusk. This is the component that's inside them. And if you look at them, there's usually a little glass or plastic opening and one of these squiggly circuits, circuit components right underneath that. So you can actively see the photoresistor if you want to. Another input that's really, really important is the push button. And so this is, for mostly any type of switch, this is exactly what you're going to be playing with. And so a, a push button is something that is very, very common. It's very, very easy to use. And they're, they're all over the place. A button like this is something that you can implement in Arduino. Um, these are the two configurations. You can wire buttons a number of different ways. A pull-down resistor, though, is definitely needed to keep this from floating. And there's some pretty complicated reasons for this. Um, but if you look at the circuit that's down here, you've got a button right there, and then this resistor. Uh, breadboards can have their own trickery, but this resistor is connected to ground. The button is connected to five volts, and the in-between is what the Arduino is watching, which looks a lot like this picture. And I'm going to play with Arduino in just a second. Uh, but in here, the Arduino digital input pin, a button is sort of like a, a variable resistor in a way. It's a variable resistor that only has two states. It's either pressed, where it's got a zero resistance, or it's not pressed, and then you can imagine it's got 10 million ohms of resistance, a very, very high resistance. And so if you press it, it's connecting the Arduino digital input pin basically directly to five volts. And if it's not pressed, this resistance is huge, and this resistance is really small. And so this is essentially connected directly to ground. Same deal here, but in reverse. You can play around with all sorts of different options for that. And if we go to examples, basics, uh, or digital and we go to, to button, we can play around with what buttons do. And 
see see exactly what this does. We should be able to play with examples. So if you want to play with buttons, you can totally do that inside of Arduino. There's examples built in for how to play with buttons. And the nice thing about learning how to use these inputs is that Arduino is built around inputs and outputs. So if you read through here, there's a total example where it's got all of this laid out. It has the same sort of hookup information where you can see another picture of the same deal. Here's the schematic, here's the code, uh, and it's gonna have an explanation of how to use all of these things so that you play through. I'm gonna be sending out in the next, or between today and tomorrow, I'll be pushing out a whole bunch of examples that should work exactly with your proto shield or your example shield. So those are things that you'll be able to play around with directly with the things that you've already built. Um, but this is a way to hook up a button if you ever wanna put one into a circuit. Another thing that's really important when you're thinking about buttons is that you don't wanna let them float. Floating buttons are an interesting thing. Most of the time people think about buttons as a very simple piece to implement. Like on a keyboard in front of you, you've got 104 different buttons. Uh, but each one needs to have a certain set of pairings. This pull down or pull up resistor is really important. There's even a configuration for Arduino where you can sort of get around it by using internal resistors to the Arduino chip itself. But you've got to be careful to avoid that floating scenario that we looked at with the graph, right? If you leave a pin disconnected, if I were to have this resistor set up and I didn't have, if I had this circuit set up, but I didn't have a resistor, then the circuit would be watching this Arduino digital input. My code might be running, trying to figure out is that pin at ground or five volts. And when I'm pressing the button, it's not a problem. Then it's directly connected to five volts. But if I'm not pressing it and this, this resistor is missing, that's called a floating pin. Those floating pins have that weird graph behavior that we saw, and that can sort of go either way if somebody waves their hand near it or there's a butterfly that goes by or whatever any super tiny impact can have on it. It means that you've got erratic behavior. Getting a floating pin is a, is a bad thing for an Arduino because it won't be able to tell if it's pressed or unpressed, which is, which is an interesting side effect. Uh, the way that an Arduino can even tell what's going on, whether it's floating or whatever, is based on a tiny, uh, sensor inside of the Atmel chip. And so that tiny sensor is essentially a very small capacitor and it only takes a few extra electrons for it to move up or down along this graph. So if you're floating, it'll, it'll do this erratic behavior where it goes up and down, things shift around. And even if I'm just sort of rubbing the table in front of me, it's enough static charge moving around that it's able to change the voltage values on that sensor. And if you leave a pin floating, this is what you're subject to. So your, your projects can behave really erratically. It's fascinating. You can really nerd out on it for a long time, but basically follow one of these three diagrams for any button that you wanna use, and it's, it's gonna work just fine. You can go way deep into the weeds for electrostatic forces for this. Uh, and there's, there's lots of fun. I have a video that I'll also share that explains sort of why this works, thinking about the input pin as a tiny bucket. Um, and sort of the electronics of that, if you're interested. This is also something that I feel is a subtle enough point that I'm trying to build a, a hands-on display. You might've seen the red oak button thing that's downstairs. It's just to try and get at this core idea. But more sensible than buttons are potentiometers. And this is a fun little explanation. A potentiometer is a really, really common part. If you're building electronics projects, these are really good places to get started. They behave much more easily. They're pretty obvious for the hookup. There's three pins. You put one on power, one on ground, and the middle one goes in as your signal. And you basically can't get it backwards. Power and ground are fine either way. But this is what's going on inside of a potentiometer. It's a resistor that's a big circle. And then there's a small wiper that goes back and forth. This video is actually great. I uh, would strongly recommend you watch the whole thing if you want. But it's showing that this has got a little contact point and when you turn the knob, it changes where it's physically located along that circular resistor. So this potentiometer lets you change resistance values. This is still a voltage divider, but it's all in one package. This is the essential volume knob, right? That lets you change the volume on something. If it's a stopped knob, if it's a knob that you can turn, but it has an end point where it won't turn any further, it's a potentiometer. So this is a category of knob that's in your lives all the time. Uh, sometimes in more modern electronics, they've been swapped out for encoders. Those are the knobs that spin without a stop. And so understanding how to use one of these can be a really 
quick and easy way to understand how to fit something in. If I wanted to, the potentiometer would be able to input all of this. And if I had one nearby, I could reliably set it to a position and it would stay there. So right now what I've got is this floating pin that's, that's pretty erratic. I should probably, uh, I could grab a potentiometer and then I'd be able to dial it into one of these values and leave it there. If you have any sort of a machine or equipment that needs calibration, these are all in the category of trim pots or trim potentiometers that you might see on the back of a, probably at this point, older electronics where you dial them in with a screwdriver and then it just stays there for forever. Those are calibration and offset style potentiometers usually. These ones that are a little bit more robust, they're this, this is the type that gets mounted inside of a guitar. And so this is more like a regular use potentiometer. It's a little bit stronger. It'll last a little bit longer uh, and they work great. Still follows the voltage divider equation. Uh, next up, number four, the PIR motion sensor. These are a little bit more expensive, I'm not gonna lie. You can see there's, there's more going on underneath the hood uh, and they've got this weird plastic dome, but these are the motion sensor ones that are on top of your, outside of your garage. They can see if things have moved or not. There's some trim pots even on these little boards, uh, but these are pretty easy to hook up to an Arduino or Raspberry Pi, and then it can see if someone's in the room at all. If you want a motion activated camera, it's probably got one of these on the front of it. If you, uh, for the garage door, they definitely put these things in. PIR motion sensors are fairly cheap. And so I'm gonna try and pull one up on Amazon, see if we can hear our motion sensor and then grab one of these. Here we go on the Adafruit learning system. And so here they are in general, these things are 10 bucks. If you buy one of them full price from Adafruit, you can definitely get them cheaper than that. But they plug in with three little wires. They've got a little sensor right here. And this is just a diffuser cap that spreads it, that changes the way the light comes in. But they're nice and easy to use. They just give you a digital out of either it's high, something's moved, or it's a low, nothing is moving in our field of view right now. And they can output three to five volts. So these are nice and easy, very tolerant of abuse. I've seen these used lots of different ways. But they're, they're a fun way to add in just simple motion sensing for about 10 bucks. Nice and simple. You can even use these along with uh, like relays and things. So if they see motion, they're, they're a part of life. These are even built into like bathroom light switches. The, the staff bathroom at work has got one of these instead of a real light switch. So you go in and as long as you're in there for not more than 10 minutes, the lights will stay on. If you're there for more than 10 minutes, I suppose they're imagining it's time for you to leave. So these sorts of things are definitely uh, useful. They've got, PIR has got a couple of different names, but these are fun sensors that, that can be plopped into any sort of a thing. These explanations on Adafruit, by the way, are super helpful because they go through all the mechanics of like how they work, what's going on, what's the science behind it. So there's tons and tons of information about lots of these inputs. Uh, if you wanted to know more, you can even learn about their field of view, sort of how they're structured, what's going on there, and how do you hook up to them. All of that information is pretty accessible, and you can see it in, in all sorts of ways through these learning systems. But uh, they're a fun tool to be able to play with. One of the next ones is capacitive touch. This is a fun system. Let's make this more full screen if it'll open up. Well, we can go to YouTube and see it. Oh, that's an ad. Uh, in here, we've got the ability to, let's see, slideshow, do it here. This capacitive sensor, it's just got a couple pieces of copper tape. You can see there's some resistors and this is a Teensy board. It's a variant of Arduino, uh, but those pieces of copper tape are gonna act like buttons. Fascinatingly, this is how the touch screen on your phone works or any touch screen basically. What they've got is a series of micro wires that run throughout the screen and a series of resistors that are partnered to them. These are very, very thick wires. Those are copper tape, but they're very fine wires that run through the glass for your phone. And so you can use a cross a crossed grid of these to tell the X, Y position of your finger over top of the screen. And because they don't directly linearly impact, they definitely have an analog signal to them you can totally use them as a way to tell how far away your finger is. For a while, Android had a feature where you could hover your finger over a spot and it would give you a tool tip or something. All of that is, is 
visible here. So you can see he's touching these things and the numbers change into the thousands. Uh, but if you get close, it'll do some other things. But this is just tape that he's applied to a piece of acrylic. There's nothing fancy here. But one of the nice things about these buttons is that there's nothing to break, right? It's not, you're not moving anything. There's no mechanical switch that's happening. You're just processing the signal. The way this works is, is all based around one of these libraries. So here's the CapSense library in Arduino. You can download this. It's really helpful to have uh, for when you want to do it. There's even where I got the graphic from. Thanks, Arduino. Uh, but this system is very fancy. It's basically using you as half of a capacitor. So it's called capacitive touch because your finger is, you, you are a big bag of water. You are conductive. And so having your finger near uh, another conductive piece of equipment changes the amount of electricity that it can hold. And by shifting that around and then constantly pulling for how much electricity those wires can hold, it's able to make sense of, is there a finger near me or not? And if the finger is touching, it's even better. But if it's close by, it can shift around the numbers. It becomes something that's super useful uh, in that you can, you can totally measure whether a person is nearby or not. Not all materials work well with this. So fingers or there's certain, you probably have seen the touch sensitive gloves. Those have a special conducting fabric on the surface so that they can do this as well. But it's essentially your fingers that are water filled that make this work well, which is really interesting. Another one that's useful to talk about, and this is just to round it out to another category of input is the real time clock module. Uh, so clocks like this can be helpful. You might have an Arduino project that you wanna fire off every 6 a.m. on a Monday. And so if that's the case, you're gonna need some way to keep track of time. Arduinos are good, um, but if power ever resets on them or something goes awry, they'll lose track of time. These are modules that you would attach, you'd wire into your Arduino. And with a battery in them, they're able to keep their, their time accurate for years. So that battery is gonna let you have lots of signal. Uh, on these chips, there's a couple of different features. You know, there's, there's a circuit, there's a chip here, an integrated circuit. There's a couple of other items that are on there. There might be a crystal uh, either inside or outside of the unit. And this battery really lets this item hold time and, and just output a time date value all the time. So it'll output every second, it'll output a new time value. And the Arduino can read that and use it to update what's going on. This is different from the other modules. It's not reading a button press. It's not a uh, analog signal. This is a separate electronics component that you're then feeding in as an input to the Arduino. So your Arduino would need to know how to read and parse that code. However, uh, if you're in Arduino, if we head over to the Arduino program, you can go to tools, maybe it's even sketch and then include library. And if we roll down through these Arduino libraries, we've got a bunch, of, I've got several of them installed. So there's all sorts of here, but here's RTC lib. This is a real-time clock library. So this is will turn on and off a, an LED connecting to a pin, and you use a real-time clock in order to make that work. A circuit, resistor, oh, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong one. But if we go to sketch, include library, it's pretty easy to find one of these libraries. So if you've got something like this that you want to work with, Arduino has a system. They realize that this is a common problem. People want to play around with these components. But if you wanted to figure out how to make the code work for all of them on your own, the library manager is the best way to get that to work. And so Arduino has this built in uh, where you can start to play around with, and I've typed that in the right way, but here are different components that you might work with. And so this is a library for the DS-130-1307 uh, RTC by Paul Stoffergen, who's a absolute powerhouse in the Arduino world. But this is a library that this person has written that you can use that basically gives you the ability to figure out how to work with real-time clocks. And so now that I've installed it, I can go to examples and then find that installed library down here. It'll be at the bottom is where it's gonna live. Let's see, somewhere down here. Oh, third up from the bottom, thanks. It's RTC lib. Uh, and so in here, in one of these, yeah, DS1307. And so here's this, you can start to see that it's got these examples for one of these chips connected via I squared C 
and a wirelib. So there's specific libraries that go with these different inputs and they'll give you lots of different information. You can say what, what the day is. You know, this, this example is just sort of showing the functionality, but it handles lots of the detail of what do you do with this thing by saying, here's, we're gonna include this library and we're gonna have an RTC object. And if I just uh, take this and search for that, if I search for RTC, we're gonna find this further on down. It does all the hard lifting. I just have to say RTC begin, and then RTC is running. If it's running, then it's gonna do some different things. If it's not running, it can adjust the time and date. It can do different details to make it work. Set up, get the time of the day of the year for right now. I can do all sorts of different interesting functions with this library. I didn't have to write all this code. Um, it comes for free. And if you read the documentation for this particular library, it'll tell you what all the different options that you have are for future.year or future now or date time, all these different things that you can do with, uh, with this particular module, you can learn by reading some documentation. And so that becomes really, really helpful when you decide that you wanna use something in one of these modules where you're not necessarily gonna be the one who's writing all the code. I, you could totally learn the nuts and bolts of how this works, but that library exists, so you shouldn't. Instead, you're just going to follow the library's examples and use that to make whatever you want to build. Chip-to-chip -chip communication like this is well described, well understood, and it's a nice thing that you can do so that you don't have to go through the mechanics of actually figuring out how to get a clock to work. This, this sort of a module is going to be $10 or less for sure, and now you've got real time added to your Arduino projects without any other struggle. So there's a handful of different chip to chip items that you might work with. There's I squared C, SPI, and FTDI. These are just for back and forth between chips and things. These are, these are different protocols. Uh, bit banging is an interesting other category. Those are when you just write your software only. You're not using any predetermined ones. You've written your own. Uh, and so all of these are options that you can play around with. They're each, they each are well described. I really like the SparkFun articles on these, by the way, uh, if you want to learn a lot more. SparkFun goes through each one of these types of communication one piece at a time, really explaining how they work, what's going on, so that you can learn all about the ones and the zeros if you're interested. You don't need to do that, um, but this communication can be really helpful. And so this will let you communicate back and forth between different processors and it opens up a whole new realm of what you can do with inputs if you master this chip to chip communication. And it's not, it's not too bad. Most of it's handled by libraries in Arduino. So you don't have to do any of the mechanisms of making this work, but it's fun to include. Another thing that's really cool is multi inputs. Uh, if you're dealing with multiple inputs at a time, time is a tricky part of that. And especially in a microcontroller, a lot of the time, if you go to examples and blink uh, or blink without delay, delays like this, delay 20 milliseconds, this means that for 20 milliseconds, your Arduino is going to do zero things. It's not going to think, it's not going to check anything, it's not going to do anything. For 20 milliseconds, it's not going to do anything at all. And that may seem like it's a very short amount of time, but in a program that's meant to run continuously, that can be a long time that really disrupts how some things might work. And so this is an interesting feature that you'll need to think about as you're working with delays. Time is a huge part of it. Uh, debouncing is, is a big part of that. It turns out that when you have a button, and so this is like a cut through of buttons that, are, that you might use. This is the one that you've played with before that you've soldered yourself. Here's other ones. That's a spring inside the button. Here's a spring inside the button. Here's a spring inside the button, right? Springs are commonly in buttons. They're trying to debounce the button. So here's your setup. You've got your circuit button here and a thing there. It turns out that they're built so that they snap from one plug to the next, from one side to the next inside of that button. There's some really cool details that go along with that and some links to documentation if you want to read a bit more. But in understanding this, there's an instant in the transfer when you go from being in contact to one to being in contact with the other where it's sort of is not going to be completely clearly in one state or the next, right? Normally, you want a button press to be just like this first one. It's not pressed, then it's pressed, then it's not pressed, and it's that clean. But in real life, what happens is in the instant that you press the button, there's sort of some static or noise. That's because there's 
electricity and and even though it can't a voltage of five volts can't jump very far at some point in the instant before contact is made it's a short enough gap that it can actually do a tiny spark and so you get these weird bouncing effects and if you're counting your button presses this might count as one two three four five six button presses instead of one and that can be a problem uh so commonly what you'll need to do is debounce a button which is something that you do in code and you think about the time right an arduino can can look at time and it would be able to discern oh this happened for two milliseconds me the person pressing a button is not going to be able to tell what two milliseconds was but the arduino can and so debouncing is a common trick that people use uh and i've got arduino pulled up here we can go to file examples um back up towards the top looking at these go to digital and debounce if you debounce a button you do interesting things right this is this is a scenario where you go in and you keep track of things right you take a look at a button and if the button looks like it's changed you record the time and then you check it again sometime later and so like right here at this point you might have noticed oh the arduino changed what we thought was happening on the button well let's wait 20 milliseconds and check the time check the status again and if it's still high then we'll take it as not noise we'll think a person really pressed the button and do something with it same deal here the button goes down you can debounce and and do the same thing buttons are very easy to imagine including in a circuit but they're a little trickier to implement they're definitely not impossible you just need to sort of learn the rules and these two guides will, will sort of guide you through that implementation if you wanted to follow through something to make it happen but it's important i mean they're all around you all the time well to log into zoom you definitely hit some buttons in real life so it's an important skill to work on but what what is next there's many many layers to these inputs there's lots of things that you could learn things that you can try and implement i'm going to be pushing out some tinkercad examples so that you can measure something you can measure something in a digital world and then you can hook it up in real life and measure it in the real world uh it's it's important, I think, to actually go through the process of setting up an input. If I were to give you a, a goal, there'll be the Tinkercad examples, but I would say set up two or three different examples of things that are real life sensors. And so that's going to be probably easiest to do by playing with that proto shield that you built earlier, the, the example shield, and just play with a little bit of code to make sure that you can actually observe whether something's happened. Sort of walk through the code of it, make sure that it's sensible and that it's outputting something that's reasonable to you. That might be through the serial monitor. It might affect whether a light blinks. Uh, the classic example is in here where maybe you do uh, examples, digital, just button. This is a, an example code that in, you know, there's there's the whole program. So lines 26 through 37 and in 11 lines, it has, done that reading so it's just reading what's going on or in a few more lines i missed the loop uh, in just a few lines right here it's reading a button and then changing the light or changing an led based on what the button is seeing so you can go up or down based on whether a button has been pressed or not pressed and so all of the business end of that happens right in here and so that's essentially what we want you to try to be able to do that with different types of sensors there's some fun ones to play with and if you wanted to play around with one, the odds are that I have one of these accessible at Make Haven or laying around at home are pretty high. So if you definitely found one that you wanted to play with, let me know and we can try and do our best to get you something. Uh, but the big goal is going to be able to, to measure something. If I were to make recommendations, it would be to stick to out of the 25, stick to the six that we talked about. And probably especially we have plenty of push buttons, light dependent resistors are easy to get, potentiometers you have on your shield. PIR motion sensors are fun. If you know you're going to have one in a project, it's probably worth buying one. And capacitive touch, you need very little to make that happen. So playing around with those different sensors and sort of how you implement them can be, can be lots of fun. Uh, and if you want to do this by just exploring, there's tons of examples that I'll be sharing over the next day or so onto Slack so that you can play with those. And then I can also help you. I'm going to be in a fair amount this week. I'll be in on Thursday, like normal. Uh, I'm going to be talking. I'll be here sort of sitting at a table talking with Ashley and happy to work with Arduino things also. 
And then on Saturday is tentatively the day I'm really going to cut the Wacom tablet stand. I've got the design for that up and running. And so we'll be able to take a look. And then on Sunday, the normal Sunday afternoon time. So if you wanted to play around with me, we can totally do that. Although I'll be pushing out a few examples. So if you wanted to play with them on your own, you'll be able to read through what's there and make some sense of these. So that is the full talking for a long time investigation of inputs, all essentially centered around the voltage divider and the, the weird floating inputs that come from an Arduino. Just the fact that like it can sense its environment in some interesting ways all the time and that we're trying to corral that by attaching it to sensors of different types. I wish I was, for those of you who aren't in the room, I wish I could show you how weird it is that I can just touch the table and the graph changes, that it's that sort of random. And you're just using a small amount of electronics to be able to control that and then respond to it in an interesting way. Right, your Arduino code mostly is just going to read this blue line and say, well, if it's over a certain value, take one action. If it's under a certain value, take a different action. Uh, so your code can be very interesting. But generally, the electronics in our life are hopefully less noisy than this. Um, so back to these. That is, that's the talk. And now it's time to do the best part, which is show and tell. So we can share a little bit about what we've been up to over the past week. Uh, if you did anything in addition to the uh, bio lab, it'd be fun to hear what you've been up to, what you've been making and doing. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see, see what you've all been up to. We've got two people in the room, and there, it looks like there's two people that are currently on the call. It is a holiday. It's Valentine's Day. So, you know, if that, if that matters. But uh, if anybody would like to share... Lisa, you you just turned on your camera. Do you have your, uh, is your board nearby? Yes, it is. Excellent. I'll give it a try to see. It's so big in terms of. Yeah. So we cut it on the Shapoko and uh, it worked beautifully. And on the back, there were some holes, which we plugged up with uh, toothpicks I banged in there with glue and then sanded it flat. So now it's all solid. And I just have to uh, finish sand it and then wax, oil it, whatever. And I'm really happy. It, it, is, it is a huge board. It's like, what well, is it 30 inches wide? See, look at it as compared to me. It's huge. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't yeah. think I could ever buy a turkey big enough to really, uh, you know, use all of it, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. You, you could almost cut two turkeys on the thing. Right. So. Or you could cut the turkey and leave the carcass in one spot and put the meat in the other. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, abs yeah, totally. It's a huge cutting board. I'm really glad that it worked out so nicely. Uh, have you have you sanded the top surface and broken the edges yet? Yes, I did, but um, I want to go further, and then of course I'm gonna uh, spray water on it to bring up the the nap. Yep. And then sand it again. That makes sense. Yeah, raising the grain is really a nice is a nice way to get a lot smoother of a project at the end. Yeah. So I will. It, I have a lot of sanding to do yet. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Awesome. Very nice. Uh, great, great job this week. And that's, that's lots of fun. Thanks. It was. Uh, James. Oh, that's it. Yeah. All right. Uh, James, you're there and smiling. What, what have you been up to? <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I have nothing to report really just the bio stuff this week and playing with a little bit more coding, but also being a little frustrated with a little bit more coding. <laughs> um, yeah, that's about it. So Cool. Lisa, that, that board came out so awesome. That looks so cool. Thank you, James. I'm really, really happy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's it. That's all I got. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right. Now we've got two people in the room and it's probably going to be easiest if you come over here and sit in front of the camera with a microphone. It's, I don't know, it's, it's still a little wonky. 
Uh, so if either of you have cool things that you want to share, you're welcome to come over here and have a seat and talk to the camera. Go for it, Vincent. So things have been busy with work. Um, I'm a little disappointed to say that I don't have anything to report, but um, I'll let you know next time. What? I'm kidding. <laughs> you stole my idea. Um, I did some e-textiles. I finally, well, almost finally finished these. Um, it's done in three layers. Um, there's a layer of felt in the middle, so that way you don't see the LEDs that are in here. I learned how to use um, the CNC embroidery machine so that way I could get the uh, text done. I, I wasn't really happy with how I did it by hand. The rest of it's done by hand though. Laser cut um, some mat boards so that way I could hide all the, the messiness in the back. It's taken a couple tries to, to get it right. The first time it was like bulging and you could see like all the circuitry and I was like, no, I've got to overbuild this. I've I've got to find some way to like make it look like like a machine made this. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with how these turned out. They they look great. Uh, I really love even with the sort of like loose back. I think it would be really cool that way. But I think it's going to be neat to see them all buttoned up and and really look. I mean, they're going to look fantastic when they're all said and done. I'm very excited. They still look fantastic now, but I'm I'm very excited to see the finished product with like a nice photo and up on the wall so that everybody can enjoy. Awesome. That's coming pretty soon. I'm moving pretty soon. Cool. Well, that's exciting too. Lots of lots of big things going on, Vincent. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And Norm. Well, I, I'm only coming over to ad, admit to failure. I I, um, I actually, I'm not kidding, uh, like Vincent was when I said I didn't do anything. But I, I tried to figure out a couple of things and failed. Um, so there's at least that. I did fail. I didn't just do nothing. I, I, I messed up. Um, one thing I was trying to do was I kind of thought I ought to be able to figure out how to take some scroll work stuff, which I... I I, I just bought for two bucks and um, uh, Etsy and um, set it up so that I could do a 3D print of it if I wanted to. But it seemed to me like I ought to be able to do a Shapeoko version of it, but I, I couldn't see any way to do that. I, I, I didn't, I mean, Carbide Motion, unless it's Carbide Motion Pro, doesn't seem to take um, the, the 3D files. I thought maybe well, I could just load G code in directly, but then I, I didn't know if that would work. Um, and um, uh, and then uh, the other thing I feel that is it's a long scroll. And I want to make a short part, so I want to take an excerpt of it. So it seemed like it ought to be easy enough to cut out just a part of the mesh object, uh, but I couldn't figure out how to do that either. I, I read up on how you're supposed to be able to do it in Fusion. 360 and and one thing about that was that it was because it was a big file maybe it was very slow fusion 360 was extremely slow to respond to stuff that i was doing but i also wasn't really sure i, I figured out how to edit the mesh object to uh cut it out to have a segment of it that would be easier to run so so two things i couldn't figure out one would be whether i can use the shape poco to cut uh, a 3D scroll of work thing. And secondly, wh whether I could uh, take the big long thing and cut it down so that it would be suitable for for the, 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 the smaller table stuff if I could figure out how to do it. So that's it, I did nothing. No, but that, I mean, those are asking good questions. And so luckily there's, I can give you some direction on how to move forward with some of those things. So they can be done. They can be done, they can totally be done. And it's, it's weird and complicated to get the software to talk to each other. But if you want, I can show you how I would tackle that problem right now. If you want. I would be interested, yeah. Cool, all right. I might need to sit where you are and yeah. do, some, do yeah. some clicking. So I'm gonna 
have a seat here and try some work. So let me adjust some of the stuff. We're going to go back to sharing screen. We'll do this screen, hit share, and escape out of that. OK, so in here, I have carbide create installed. And so I can open that up. But more interestingly is vCarve. And so I'm going to open up vCarve also. And, and vCarve is totally not the starter software. I want to, I want to be real clear. Carbide Create is, is great. vCarve is also really great, but in a much more complicated and aggressive way. And so inside of Carbide Create, which is here as we're rolling through things, you can totally do an import and then there's import lots of different options. Yeah, I could import uh, SVG, uh, SVG, but I didn't see how to import I have an SPL and it didn't. Right. This will only import vector files, so DXF and SVGs, and that's that's all that this is really capable of working with, which is a bit of a shame. Like it feels like a missed target, and I think that ultimately, when they made that choice for Carbide Create, that was just because they wanted it to be a a one one type of item. Carbide. Right. And so Carbide Create Pro makes sense that it would be nicer, but it's what it's directly competing with is vCarve. The license for this is a little wonky. And basically, I would just like, let's go sit down with Lior and make sure that we get it on a computer. Um, but once you have this installed, it's not too bad to deal with things. This is set up right now for a full sheet of plywood, which is what my next cut is going to be. But if you're using the Shapoko, that's 30 inches by 30 inches. And then your piece might be you know, 3 quarters of an inch thick. Uh, you can zero it to the machine bed, use an offset, and maybe go from the center or the bottom left corner and then hit OK. Uh, inside of here, there's lots more options. So you can do file, import, and then a component or 3D model. So you can totally just import directly. Let me go a little slower. File, import, you can import vectors or a bitmap or a 3D model. And so that's what I'm going to, that's, and so I'm going to go into here and I think, well, this has got 3D models in it. They're maybe not the most exciting 3D models, but Here's a 3D model <laughs> that I made. It was intended to be 3D printed, right? But it's still a 3D model that's able to be played with. And so along here, you've got some dynamic. Let's just do like that. It's going to be a little strange. Um, oh, we can change the orientation of the thing. So you can rearrange what side it's facing. And so if we do something like this we'll play around just trying to get this as an example um boom, 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 boom. top bottom left back okay okay all right i had it here so here's here's a 3d geometry and if we put this barrier right there it should be able to try and cut out that as much as possible yep Oh, for sure. Absolutely. A hundred percent. The Makehaven licensing process for VCarve is a, is a little tricky. And I don't, I didn't follow the normal one because I wanted to have it so that I could export for teaching purposes. But if you go to uh, Makehaven Gerber, and so if you go to the Gerber CNC for Makehaven, in, inside of here, if you're logged in, at some point there are instructions for. Well, I don't know, I take up the whole. No, you're good. But, but I looked at that. Yes. Like there was some further thing that I needed assistance on to, uh, to get the license. Yeah, I'll talk to Leo and make sure. I know I tried it and found that it, it didn't work, but um, I don't remember the details. Yeah. You didn't know. I mean, uh, absolutely. And getting getting this installed, it's it's definitely a different version. Like the we have a makerspace license as a space that's I think gifted to us by VCarve, if I'm not misunderstanding. And they have only a certain number of installable things where you can export G code directly from uh, VCarve. 
but then there's like nodes where you can install it on your computer, do all the design work, but then you need to come here with that save file and just open it. And then you can export the G code if you're physically here. Code for it that was intended for a 3D printer. Oh, yeah. Um, well, there's a few. If we search for NC Viewer, what you can do is, is load it into something like NC Viewer. And so in here, you can get G code to be viewed. And this is a little, we're going to go into here and then. I think I have some G code inside of the garden. And this G code is also for a 3D printer. Um, so it's going to take a minute for this to process. But 3D printer G code and CNC G code is going to look a little bit different. <laughs> that <laughs> so that's that's lots of fun. Uh boy, that it, the, yeah, that's that's essentially like what it feels like sometimes is just expressed as a as an overall thing. So there's definitely some differences, right? Here's the part that is going to be 3D printed, but it definitely is not exactly the same. Uh, but that that's totally the piece that I was hoping to 3D print um, when designing this thing originally. Let's go to the home view. It's over here. And so it's got somewhere embedded in there the motion. So it may not directly translate from 3D printer to CNC um, because they're trying to do different operations. That's 3D printers are additive and this is generally for subtractive things. This is whatever this is, wherever that is in the code isn't, isn't gonna be a good sign. Um, but fundam, fundam so Fusion 360 totally can. And this is, this is what I, I had intended to cut out the Wacom tablet stand this weekend. And then I realized I wanted to nail it because we're gonna probably share these design files with everyone. I wanted to make sure that I buttoned up all the details. Um, and it's Fusion 360's loading on my other screen right now. So bear with me for a second. Well, I mean, so uh, I can't read. Well, no, I, I won't. Oh, my, what am I saying? It won't go to create. I don't know whether it will go with carbide motions. So it it will. One of the things that is important, if we go to tool paths and then I'm just going to click on this, uh, let's go to tool paths and 2D view, and we can do the actual like cutout. So I'm going to do the roughing tool path for this object and just sort of zoom in on it. There's there's the object. This is inside of VCarve while Fusion is still loading. And I'm just going to say, I'm going to do this cut, do this thing, do a quick calculate, and it's going to decide what all those tool paths are. If I'm outputting for, and this is you know not really what we wanted, but the thing here is that if I go to save this file and output it, there's a handful of things that are interesting. This is outputting with a post processor for the Shipoko and in inch mode. Uh, and so I can 3D model inside of vCarve and then output it to the Shipoko straight from vCarve. The EMC2, this is for the Gerber. And then the other CNC that we have in here is Path Pilot. And that is for, um, for the Tormach, which is another one of the options. But basically, your most commonly used ones are going to be right up here. VCarve can totally output straight for the Shipoko. It's going to put the right stuff at the beginning and end of the toolpath. If I take this and save this 3D roughing toolpath, let's just throw this right onto my desktop and hit save. So it's there, and now if I open up, oh, that is on the other desktop. So here's this file. If I were to open this up, it opens it here. And right in here, this is the G code. So there's some of the things that G code, a CNC usually has simpler G code than a 3D printer, but it's the same description of motion, right? G1 is go somewhere, and this is go somewhere in the X dimension of 15.509. Or 15.1509 and y of 14.8841, right? So it's just describing how to move. The thing that's different from machine to machine is this little bit at the beginning where they're setting up, okay, tool one, G17, G20, some of these things that are specific from one machine to the next. Oh, yeah, so I got an idea. I think it's no great. So I'm not calling out that, but I might Slack message something. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's, I mean, we're definitely headed this direction, right? This 
this G code stuff is something that's going to be important. And so just to keep it near the top of mind is, is useful. Um, we'll definitely circle back to this more as we think about all this stuff, but uh, yeah. There's there's lots to learn, but if you can get your hands on VCarve, even if it's the stuff down here, if you have the STL, we should be able to crank through the details of getting it to work on the Tripoco. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that's it, everybody. I'm going to post a bunch of things, but if you feel feel inspired to try out different input sensors, if you just want to play with that um, practice shield that we built early on, you can totally just play with that and try and figure out how the inputs work there. And then if you want to start to build something that's that's really an Arduino project, you can totally start to get inspired in that in that direction also. So that is it, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a Happy good night. Valentine's Thanks. Good night. Yeah. Good night.